Welcome to the Seminarian Convos podcast. In this podcast, we discuss what we've learned on our theological journey. So, Rebecca, I heard more feedback. I had more people text me about the last one on text-driven preaching than all of the others combined, all of our other episodes. That's true. That's true. So this is sort of part two of text-driven preaching and talking through preaching philosophies. And it's going to be a little bit more, I would say, interview style because I'm not a preacher and I have not taken preaching classes. So Eric, you're the expert in this regard. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but I feel like I just scratched the surface. <laughs> well, starting off, you had talked about in your expository preaching class that there were some common questions or common topics that were brought up and discussed And one of those was what to do if your text does not specifically have the gospel in it. Do you preach the gospel anyway? Uh, How do you get the gospel into every text in the Bible? That's a great question. I mean, and, and preachers of all preaching philosophies wrestle with this question. You're preaching a text, and quite frankly, it's... Maybe a text is not really about Jesus. Maybe it emphasizes another person of the Godhead. Maybe it's on the Holy Spirit or, or the Father. Or maybe it's just really, you know, just life issue oriented. Maybe you're preaching through Proverbs and it's a general principle. Mm-hmm. How do you put Christ in? I think that you, you don't twist the text, first of all. That's what you don't do. You don't mingle the text and put the text in a headlock and try to find Christ in there somewhere. Uh, Isaac carrying the wood is not the same as Jesus carrying the cross. <laughs> <laughs> Don't create types of Christ and everything. <laughs> I mean, certainly there are some types of Christ, mm-hmm. though. However, we can't, we got to be careful not to really reach to things because congregants, you know, the listeners of the congregation, they learn hermeneutics from their pastor's preaching. Mm. So how that, how, how the pastor preaches and handles the word of God is how they're teaching the congregation to handle the word of God. And if we are overly creative and try to thrust Christ upon a text when he's simply not there, then we're going to teach our congregation to be overly creative and to really just make the Bible mean anything they want. So that's what you not do. You, you can always make a simple application though. You can, okay. So you can always apply the text to believers and unbelievers. Mm -hmm. And I think that Every single sermon needs to have an application for believers and an application for unbelievers. And a lot of the times, the application to the unbelievers needs to be the gospel. Yeah. Needs to have the gospel. Because there are some principles. If, say if you, are, if you are preaching a text that simply deals with just simply the Christian life or something, an unbeliever is going to be present, is not going to understand any of that. Hmm. Talk about that. And yeah. talk about here. Here's how you can. Maybe you can be a part of this. You can. You can still yeah. make an apl- application to it. Well, even don't... like you were talking about with proverbs, if you are preaching through the principles there, you can make the application without the the Holy Spirit. It's impossible to conquer your pride or to not give in to lust or different things like that. Yeah, that's a great. Maybe not impossible, but nearly impossible yep. to do it on your own. Well, then, what about text driven preaching and plagiarism? Yeah, that's a question too, because I mean, let's face it, as a preacher, I'm, when I heard, first heard of this philosophy of text-driven preaching, I was like, okay, so if it's just all about the text, then technically I should be able to listen to another pastor's uh, sermon on the text, and I can, I, I can just listen to John MacArthur every week. I can find what he said about this and, and, and just preach his message. John MacArthur 2.0. Well, there's a lot of those. <laughs> But, yeah, I mean, seriously, that's a question, though, that we wrestle with. And certainly there's nothing wrong with listening to other pastor sermons. I have several pastors that I listen to if I preach through a book, and I'll try to listen to them at the end of the week to try to make sure that I'm handling the text right. Because if I come up with something completely different than other good pastors with good education that are text-driven preachers, I'm probably wrong, and I need to take a second look. Mm-hmm. But now here's the thing. As you remember when I talked about the, the, you know, the philosophy, or sorry, the method of text-driven preaching, that is how you actually preach, go line by line and emphasize two things. One, emphasize concepts that are going to be uh, lost. Uh, for example, I, you know, just this past Sunday we did one on, I had to ta- talk about childbirth. And even though we understand what childbirth is, there's a danger in New Testament childbirth that so many ladies 
died while giving birth. Mm -hmm. The mortality rate was way higher than it is now. So I had to park there and make sure that everybody understood when they talked about childbirth, it was a scary thing. It was, it was not just joy. I mean, it was often where it was a few hours before that lady would be in the grave herself Mm -hmm. and that kind of, so that's a concept that's lost that you have to park on with text driven preaching. And the other time you really need to park in text driven preaching is where if the scripture is dealing with a topic that you your specific congregation knows, or or I'm sorry, needs help in or Mm -hmm. needs instruction in. You pastor as you preach. Now, obviously, you don't want to go overboard with this and make the whole sermon uh, of a text about a minor point in the text. The main thrust of the text must be your main thrust of the sermon. However, you as the pastor are the pastor of that congregation, and you need to pastor as you preach and uh, help the congregation understand some concepts that maybe they need to uh, be introduced to or grow in or something like that. And that is why plagiarism is so silly with text-driven preaching. No two sermons should ever sound exactly the same because as much as you're listening to a, another preacher and I might say, oh, he parked there. Oh, wow, that's so good. Well, maybe he said that because he knows of something of his congregation that his congregation specifically needed that. And even though that may be a good application, what if that's not the same application that your congregation needs? So preaching is not just about preaching, it's about pastoring also. Yeah. And thinking of plagiarism too, you're referring to preaching almost word for word exactly what somebody else preached, correct? There's nothing wrong with saying, you know, maybe in a little portion, John MacArthur said it really well and you just, you want to quote what he said and, and you reference, you know, John MacArthur said such and such. Yes and no, I would say about that, honestly. There's certainly nothing wrong with saying, um, with saying, uh, I quote Wearsby a lot mm-hmm. in, in mine, for example. He has some really good uh, applications. Sometimes I'll say, Warren Wearsby said, but listen, when you study for a sermon, and, and that's okay, you wouldn't know this because you're not a preacher, yeah. <laughs> but you know, when, when, when preachers study for sermons, you're reading materials from all over, and you're reading so many different resources, you're not going to be able to remember, say, uh, Spurgeon said this, MacArthur said that, Wearsby said this, yeah. uh, J. Frank Norris said that, oh, Jerry Vine said this. I mean, I half saying. of your sermon cannot be other people's names. And certainly uh, there's times when some stuff comes out that we studied for that we don't reference. And mm-hmm. uh, there's a difference. That's not plagiarism, though. Right, right. Plagiarism is intentional, long, and you purposely taking the credit for their it. Their mannerisms, their stories, Correct. Et there there see. comes a point where you when you marinate yourself in all of the resources, all of those just come out on Sunday morning. And certainly I don't, I don't consider that plagiarism. So you don't have to well, uh, even, reference everything. Yeah. Even studying for our Equip Central class, our Sunday school hour, I know with some of the commentaries that I've read, you start to see this theme. And so you may say the exact words the way one of those people said, but it's a reoccurring theme that you were reading over and over. So I can kind of understand that. Yeah. And then here's another question. As far as being text driven, how would you decide which book to preach? In other words, are you going to go through in canonical order, starting with Genesis, going to Revelation? Are you going to go through historically? You know, what's the first book that we know was written and then try to go? I mean, some they don't know the exact date, but to the best of your ability, their historical order. How would you decide that to say I'm truly text driven? Does it have to be Genesis to Revelation and then start over again? I mean, that's a great question. Do we have to do it in canonical order? Because canonical order is not necessarily the order. I mean, for the longest time, these New Testament, or even the Old Testament, was put together in scrolls, and the New Testament on little parchments. What if the earliest church had them in a different order? Which they surely did. Mm -hmm. I mean, the order, what I'm trying to say is, the, the, the order of the books, how we have them today, that order is not inspired. So I, I don't think it really matters, quite frankly. Certainly every pastor has uh, liberty to pick and choose whichever one, as long as he preaches it all eventually. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I don't think there's... Maybe you would of... need to take a break from Genesis as long as it is occasionally I, or... I mean, I don't think there's a one right answer to that. Gotcha. I think that every pastor is different. I know, I know pastors that have been in the Gospel of, of Luke for four years. Wow. Um, I, I 
just all depends. You may not need to take a break. With text-driven preaching, you want to know what's next. Yeah, you're, that's true. You're, it's like you're on the journey with Jesus there. But That's a good point. I don't think there's really, you can't preach the wrong book. Mm -hmm. Because the question that you're really asking is, how do you decide which book to preach? The book you preach is the Bible. Yeah. Well, so, amen to that. <laughs> so, well, you, you, God has already given us those 66 books. And if you are preaching that, you are preaching the word of God. So, I mean, I don't think God is sitting up on his throne saying, it's not the time for James. I want you to preach Colossians <laughs> right now. No, you preach what God has clearly revealed. Now, certainly there can be some strategy to it, too. For example, the reason why I went through 1 Thessalonians first is what in my new pastor right here was, uh, you know, it deals with a lot of the model church. Uh, what does a good church look like? What does a strong, healthy church look like? And I thought that was a good time to just get everybody on the same page and really establish myself in the church so we can just connect on what a healthy church looks at. Obviously, I ran that by the other two elders, um, but we only have two more weeks of that left, so I need to talk to them in the elders meeting next week, actually, about, and, and get their advice on uh, which book to do next. So uh, as long as you're preaching a book of the Bible— <laughs> I don't think there's really a wrong, wrong answer. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, text-driven preaching is a philosophy and a method. Um, the method is walking through the text, and that's actually been fun. I learned so much from you. I feel like, in a way, um, you know, you're about to start your doctoral studies, but I feel like I've gleaned a lot from your MDiv and the discussions that we have, and it's changed the style of the way I study, um, even for our, our class, and to, to get some points, talking points with that. And it's neat to see how God's Word, even in Proverbs, um, at least on those first nine uh, chapters, it is kind of a storyline, and you're following along, and there's just this natural outline there for you already, and that's been kind of fun. So the method is walking through the text, and then the philosophy. Can you speak to that? Well, text-driven preaching is. It's both a method and a philosophy. The method, you walk through the text, you park in those two areas, and then the philosophy of it is you preach through books, and you preach through the Bible. This philosophy is the Scripture alone is sufficient. God revealed. You don't have to wonder, what do I preach? Pick mm -hmm. one. You're not going to preach the wrong book. It's all the scripture, and, as, and, and it forces you to deal with the entire Bible, forces you to deal with awkward subjects, subjects like gay marriage, sexual sin. You're already going to deal with that stuff in due time, and since you actually come upon those in scriptures naturally, nobody's going to wonder about anything. You don't have to host, be hostile and speak against everybody all the time and move from issue to issue, as we'll see in a minute. You actually deal with things more naturally, mm -hmm. uh, and it prevents you from preaching pet peeves because, as you said when I was a youth pastor. <laughs> yeah, you said to me one time, you're like, help me to not talk on this same subject or use the same word over and over because if you have your pet peeve or your little soapbox, it loses its importance to the teens and it becomes a joke yeah, instead I, of the <laughs> the emphasis that you wanted it to have. It then becomes a joking point. I used to say all the time to the teens and I, and I caught myself I, and I don't think your they ever caught on to it. Wreck. Yes, that was it. <laughs> it was like, if you don't get this, your life will be a train wreck. Every lesson. Yes. Oh, that's funny. I remember those. Those were good times. But it keeps Christ the center of the church, text-driven preaching does. You don't have to wonder what to preach. You don't have to wonder, am I preaching the wrong book? If it's one of the 66 books, it's not the wrong book. <laughs> yeah. Just don't preach from the Apocrypha. Yeah. All right. Well, what are some other philosophies of preaching that are not so great as text-driven? Well, let's compare and contrast well, a little the, bit here. Okay, so disclaimer. I would say that I believed every single one of these before myself. So this mm -hmm. is a journey, I, I, and we're not, I'm not bashing any other pastors out there. No, no, no. This is from personal experience, okay? Mm -hmm. There's a time where I espoused every one of these different preaching philosophies. So, but text-driven preaching is not the only preaching philosophy out there, and there's many more. We're just going to look at three different ones, and we're going to look at the positives and the negatives. All right. The first one is I would call nugget-driven, and 
And what this one is, it's really kind of the lack of a preaching philosophy altogether. What's your strategy? You really don't have one. You're not walking through a book at all. You're not in a series at all. It, every sermon is a standalone sermon. And you feel like that, hey, it's my goal. If everybody walks in, if they leave with a nugget from the word, something they've never heard before, one, even if it's one line that they've never heard before, then boom, th their tithe is paying off. <laughs> Panning for gold this Sunday. Ah, yeah, that one little nugget. Well, the positives of that, I suppose, is that your congregation will always be uh, on their toes. They're not going to know what to expect week from week, which could be a positive or a negative, but yeah. it keeps things interesting. I mean, sometimes I feel like if you're preaching through um, a book of the Bible that somebody, maybe that's their favorite book of the Bible, they might have a tendency to tune out the pastor if they're like, oh yeah, I've studied this chapter a lot, or it's Easter and you're preaching through a series on, you know, the crucifixion. So I suppose the nugget model keeps you on your toes and can keep people engaged a little bit. That would be a positive. I mean, it, it yeah, it definitely makes a clear attempt to teach something new. There's nothing wrong with that. Now, that's a very basic positive and maybe even a weak one because I think that should be a given. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I can't think of anything else, honestly, any other <laughs> positives for this. Well, the negatives, and this is one I saw when you kind of espoused this model, was that it puts too much pressure on you as the pastor or as a Sunday school teacher. Because I remember oh, yeah. um, right before we got married, you started a young adults class. And it was either then or when you became the youth pastor when we were newlyweds. It, it would just be such a stress on you of what am I supposed to teach next until you you know decided to, to do a series on a particular thing or to go through a book. You know, there were times I was up until 2 or 3 a.m. working on my sermon and you would be going to bed at like, you know, 1 a.m. trying to wait up for me. I'd be like, no, I'm still working on my sermon. But what I didn't tell you is I was actually still trying to figure out the text. I didn't even know what the text was the night before really Yikes. super late well, because it puts so much pressure on you. I need something new. I need something new. And then I would think of something. Oh, yeah, that's a good one. Well, I've heard that a thousand times. So, mm -hmm. and I don't realize, even though I've heard it a thousand times, maybe the congregation hasn't. So I dismissed mm -hmm. it or something like, I don't know. It, it's really confusing and it really undercuts the sufficiency of scripture. Mm -hmm. It really, really, it's kind of a low view of scripture because it makes the main truths kind of become boring. Hmm. You have to search for something, something new, a new interpretation or something. So it can lead to bad hermeneutics also. Yeah. And then also your congregants never get the whole picture either. It's not coherent. It's kind of leapfrogging your way through the scriptures. Imagine if I had a thousand piece jigsaw puzzle and every week, Rebecca, I would go through, I would open the box myself and, and I would try to look for one singular piece that really looked cool. All right. Hey, this one piece looks cool. And I open the box and I find one cool looking piece. And every week I gave you that one piece. Now that piece could be from anywhere in the puzzle, mm -hmm. but I gave you one. And every week I, when I gave you that one cool looking piece, whoa, that was kind of cool. Well, then the next week I give you another piece. And, but what, but you don't realize is you have no clue how those pieces come together and you never see the whole picture. You never get the whole picture because you have all of this random pieces from a thousand piece jigsaw puzzle. So it's all pretty and they look cool, but it doesn't give you that big picture. No, it's, and they never, you never end up preaching the whole counsel of God that way. You never, never do. Yeah. So that's the nugget driven. What about issue driven or reactionary sensationalism? I feel like this could come by many names. Yeah, we touched on this in our first one, but let me reiterate it and we'll dive in even more so. Um, sensationalism, reactionary driven, issue driven, and that's kind of when you're known more for what you're against than what you're for. Usually you're constantly preaching current events, really big on news stories in the sermon. The illustrations almost always have to do with this week's news, the breaking news, and the pastor is constantly addressing every last little thing that comes up in the whole hot cultural topics, all right? Um, I feel like in church history, J. Frank Norris is a good example of this if you study his life and his preaching style. Yeah, that's exactly it. And and certainly there, there's a time where a pastor needs to confront an issue and deal with an issue. So uh, this whole thing is not is not junk here. I mean, there's 
there's some legitimate biblical instruction concerning these hot cultural topics. So there are some legitimate positives. What are some positives, Rebecca? Well, you will draw a crowd, that's for sure. People like exciting preaching, and you can grow your church pretty fast. Too. Very fast. If you become a sensational preacher constantly speaking against all the hot topic things, people like that. Yeah. And you will draw a crowd. And as people get saved, too, I feel like it could be helpful to new believers, especially in, if you're in an unchurched culture um, like California, where we used to live. There's a lot of people that don't have a biblical worldview on a lot of things. So I think that sort of preaching style could be helpful to new believers just to get them thinking about um, assessing the cultural, uh, assessing their culture from God's point of view and thinking on critical issues from a biblical worldview. Yeah, it will definitely help the new believers and those young in the faith. It'll help them to navigate these issues, all right? Uh, it keeps people aware of God, too. Like, when they're going about their week, when they're not in church, they're constantly thinking of, oh, the culture is dangerous because it's, you know, you're all, you hear all that in church. So, I mean, is that good? Well, yes and no. I mean, th there is good in it, and that is you're aware of God. You're constantly assessing the culture and doing your best, hopefully, to live for Him. But there are some negatives. I think the big thing is that it can become very toxic because it breeds hostility and self-righteousness. And you can begin to think, I'm the one of the few that's standing fast for the Lord despite, you know, everybody else. Yeah, because going essentially the, wrong way. the only thing that's being preached is here's why everybody else is wrong and here's why we are right. It affirms you and if you're doing what's right. <laughs> yeah, and, and before you know it, once again, church members learn hermeneutics from their pastor's preaching, so uh, that carries over into this too. They leave church and think it's their duty to go tell everybody else where they're wrong and pick fights. Hmm. And it really does breed hostility. And I feel like it, there could be two major issues with people that send out of this preaching style quite frequently is that they can get a fatalism idea of that basically God's mission is dying out and, you know, the Great Commission is not going forward and we're the, we're the few that remain that are, yeah. that are righteous. Yeah, and over time it really leads to this fatalism, this defeatist mentality because you're constantly always hearing about this is what's wrong, this is the new thing that's wrong and the world is getting more dangerous and evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, which, yes, that, that scripture is true. But there almost comes into a thing where like the church feels like they're backed into a corner and they need Jesus to come rescue. And you can't see people saved anymore. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it, it's dangerous. The over time, that philosophy is is very dangerous and it's unhealthy. I think another big thing with it too is this this issue driven is you're really not teaching people to be open and learn because all you're doing is assuring people that they're already right. So you're not really raising up Bible students. You're not really raising mm. up Christians that are genuinely open minded. So they'll be weak in the faith too because yeah. they're not grounding themselves. They're just giving themselves a pat on the back every week because I don't do those bad. Things. Yes, quite frankly, they're scared to learn. Learning is dangerous. Hmm. Well, number three, you can have the agenda or progress driven or pastor driven. Yeah, I think we, we have said. three <laughs> names for this agenda driven, progress driven, growth driven, you could yeah, call yeah. it pastor driven. So we have a long description here. This one, um, it's very goal oriented, all right? Uh, what goal does the pastor want to see the church uh, the, uh, accomplish next in the church? Is it church growth? Is it numbers? Is it baptisms? Is it new buildings? Is it new ministries? Uh, whatever it is, is it a certain program? Usually in churches that are really subscribed to this agenda, progress-driven, the pastor is usually a very, very strong leader, usually very type A conqueror leader type guy. Uh, he'll often be very personality driven, uh, often have kind of the man of God aura to him because he, you have to have that in order to really lead the church like this because it's mm. so agenda driven. It is so progress driven. Uh, the pastor is the authority. Usually these churches really embrace the business model of church. That pastor mm. is the CEO and there's not a plurality. Usually it's one man, the not, man of God. 
There's not an ebb of ebb and flow. It's always charge. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I was listening to the rise and falls of Mars Hill, and mm-hmm. one thing I, I listened heard in that podcast, um, and it's kind of like the same philosophy. And they, they said they don't go on. They need the okay. Let me start again. They said that uh, the pastor there never took his church on a retreat. It was always an advance instead of a retreat. Hmm. And that's one example right there of a very progress-driven, agenda-driven. And by the way, this kind of philosophy has a lot of very good pros to it. All right. So let's look at those pros. Well, the philosophy preaches the word of God, that's for sure. And a lot of times it can be in context too. I mean, it, um, if you're thinking about those that preach for to get a building built or whatever, I think we've all known of pastors or heard of pastors that are preaching through and they're using the rebuilding of the wall in Jerusalem or the rebuilding of the temple. And they do preach maybe even the whole book in context to kind of get people excited about, hey, we can build just like they did. Yeah, these are good, you know, these pastors, they're they're good pastors. They're good preachers. Usually their method of preaching, once again, they do walk through the text. They are, Mm -hmm. you can be a a expository preacher and be progress-driven, agenda-driven, all right? Um, Usually their sermons, the the structure of them, they walk through the text. They genuinely do preach the word of God. And because of that, they genuinely see real fruit. You Mm -hmm. see people saved in this. I mean, it's progress-driven. So the church is going forward. The church is being built. Visible results, and that's always encouraging, you know. And if you have a night to look back on the year before your vision night or whatever, where the church is going and kind of recapping, Hey, this is what we all prayed for. This is what we gave towards and look what we happened. Look what, look what we did. You know, if you see a building go up, if you see the new class or the new program, that is exciting. And people like to be part of something that's new and exciting and constantly changing sometimes. Yo, the churches are very exciting to be in. I think you nailed it. There's always something new. There's always new direction. It's encouraging to see those goals. One thing I would also say, say about the preaching is it's extremely persuasive, which is good. Mm. That's an important part of rhetoric. Preaching must persuade. And you, when you leave these kind of services of this agenda-driven, I'll tell you what, you're ready to go charge the gates of hell with a squirt gun. I yeah. mean, it is exciting. Yeah. yeah, which is a good thing, which is a good thing. But there are negatives. I think when the philosophy of preaching is subordinate to the leading of the pastor, Yeah, that's big. That's really big. So the method, once again, the method of preaching and the philosophy of preaching. Text-driven preaching is both a method and a philosophy. The method is walking through the text, parking in the areas that need to be parked in. The philosophy rests on the sufficiency of Scripture. Is the Scripture enough? What do you preach? You preach the Scripture. Well, in this agenda-driven preaching, Oh, well, it's it's growth driven. It's agenda. The pastor thinks, you know, hey, uh, God told me we need to build a new building. So I'm going to do a series on building or uh, God told me we need to better our outreach. So let me do a series on that. And certainly neither one of those are wrong necessarily. Mm -hmm. But how if when you when you back up. How that pastor handles the Word of God, the Word of God ultimately is really not the ultimate authority. The pastor's vision is. Mm. And that is so, so dangerous. Once you actually, the more you actually think about that and the more you realize that, the more dangerous it really is because the, the Bible is really not the ultimate authority. The pastor's vision is, and the Bible is a means to see the vision accomplished. Mm. So it assumes that the pastor's vision is God's vision. Mm. So which leads to a low view of scripture and almost elevates the pastor to almost this priest. He's this intermediary between you and God, and he's going to give you the message. From which God. is why you get that man of God aura in this style. Yes, you're exactly right. I think, too, this doesn't really build a long-term healthy church. It's not, if you have somebody that leaves right in the middle, that's not necessarily going to (laughs) go with them to their new church, and that's going to be what that church is. I mean, if you're preaching about soul winning, for instance, everybody needs to go soul winning wherever. 
for sure. But if it's just pumping people up for this one program or this one church, that may not be cross-cultural if God leads them on to another state, another culture, even another country. That's a great example, and that's a challenge to every pastor, uh, myself included here. Uh, when we preach and when we lead our churches, we are in kingdom work and uh, once we, fa- I mean, every church is important. Okay, every church. I'm not dismissing anything, but we need to be more excited about God's kingdom than our own church, because mm. that's what it's really about. And if, it, and and once again, going back to this agenda driven, well, ten times out of ten, basically, all the agenda has to do with the next step for this church. Well, guess what? It's not God's will for every member to be a lifelong member of your church. So how are you preparing them to better themselves for the kingdom, for Mm. kingdom work, not just for your kingdom work? Yeah, and I think too it it causes people to lean too heavily on that one pastor, so that if he something ever happened to him, he had to step down, he passed away, is that is that ministry just going to crumble because it was all built on that one person instead of their their love and their their they're soaking up the word of God. <laughs> yeah, ultimately the pastor's vision is never as big as God's. Yeah. And that's that's the thing is as much as we think, "Oh, it's big. We can we can really get a lot accomplished in a short amount of time." Yes, but it, I think that when you really examine it, it really lacks the longevity as true text-driven preaching mm-hmm. does. And God sees the big picture. <laughs> yeah, and it's really it's really hard on the church members because as much as it's exciting, it's like, man, they're being pushed for this and then pushed for that. And then another special offering for this, then another special offering for that. And then three months later, another one when it's tax season. And I mean, mean, let's just face it, people get burned out. These kind of churches really have a high uh, rollover rate. They They have a high turnover rate in their membership. People get burned out. But the pastor accomplishes the agenda and the church bless god is moving forward 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 yeah so in listening to this if you felt like wow this really appeals to me but i don't know much about text driven preaching or i don't know how to study to be text driven let's start with uh, as we name some resources what are some commentaries that could help with text driven preaching and this is actually a question that i had asked you the other day uh, to explain to me the different types of commentaries and we discussed this in studying for uh, sunday school material well when you're text driven you're stopping at every single clause or phrase and you're commenting on it and and and, and telling people how this fits in because every word is inspired right mm-hmm. So what you're not, the commentaries that you're really not going to really depend on, there's, there's what's called devotional commentaries, okay? A devotional commentary is focused primarily on application, and it's really creative with application. It's like reading a devotional, quite frankly. It's really like reading a devotional. Those you really kind of want to stay away from. I really don't read a lot of those. The ones that are just uh, application, application. Um, the kind that I really pick up and really run with when it comes to text-driven preaching are exegetical commentaries or expository commentaries or really I, I, I kind of prefer exegetical commentaries so expository commentaries let me let me let me define each one of those yeah. an expository commentary is basically a sermon that a guy preached okay typed out basically mm-hmm. you know heavily outlined things like that but mm-hmm. and it breaks down the scripture with you in a preaching type of format and you, yes you see his exegesis but you also see a lot of his devotional thoughts so that's kind of a hybrid in between the two so you have a devotional commentary that's really focused on application devotional thoughts you have ex- expository commentaries and then you also have an exegetical commentary an exegetical commentary is primarily focused on the exegesis of scripture it's focused Focused on defining every one of these clauses, words, what it's dissecting the scriptures and saying, how does this work? How does this grammar work? So, a couple of series of exegetical commentaries that I really like to, to, to read is the Baker exegetical commentary series is really good. The Pillar New Testament commentary series is phenomenal. Um, uh, Zondervan has a really good one, the exegetical commentary on the New Testament or on the Old Testament, very good one, and the New American commentary on a really good one. And here's one clue. 
if it's one person that did the whole commentary of the whole Bible, for example, J. Vernon McGee through the Bible, that's more of a devotional commentary. I would mm. I would do it as because even though he is offering some exegesis and stuff, he'll go off on like uh, booze. That booze was a big thing in his time with prohibition and everything like that. Mm. So like you know he'll really have these issues his that pet he'll peeve. yes he'll <laughs> yeah exactly his pet peeve, but also J. Vernon McGee may be really good with a couple books, but listen, once you back up and actually think about it, what one person has such a good handle on the entire Bible that they can really write a phenomenal, awesome, exegetical commentary on every single one? That's a different philosophy than a lot of these other ones. With the Pillar New Testament, the New American Commentary, the exegetical commentary on the New Testament, they'll have a serious editor, but every commentary will be written by a different person. And the reason why that's important is the people that write those are scholars that are devoted their life to study that one book. So they know the original language in the Greek or Hebrew better than almost anybody else. For example, Douglas Moo is one of the greatest scholars in the book of James. Well, guess what? He wrote the Pillar New Testament commentary for the book of James. Mark Taylor, one of our professors at Swibbits, he taught uh, two of my Greek classes. He wrote, I think he wrote his dissertation on 1 Corinthians with his PhD. He's a scholar with uh, 1 Corinthians. Well, in the New American Commentary, he wrote the one on 1 Corinthians. So when you see different different people writing the different books in a series, that's a good thing. That says that that commentary series chose the best scholars per for every book. Those ones are usually gold because you don't have to know Greek in order to read a commentary. You can read a commentary, a Greek exegetical commentary, ignore the Greek on it, and you can really get, and, and it's amazing, you'll get all kinds of nuggets doing this. When you read through these and when you read through the scripture over and over and when you embrace text-driven, you really get way more nuggets than you do ever nugget-driven. And two other final resources that you have mentioned are resources by David Allen, who is a preaching professor at Swibbits. And one of those is his book, Preaching Tools. Basically, that it's a breakdown of, that's not even really a book that you like open up and read. That's a book that's more of a resource. So when I preach through a book, I typically pick up that book and he'll have a bio on all the best commentaries for it. And he'll have it broken down where it says devotional commentaries, exegetical commentaries, expository commentaries and things. That one, if you want to be a text writer preacher, you need that book. I've sent it to several people. It's only like, I think it's less than 10 bucks. You need to get that book. It's gonna, it's, it'll, it'll help you pick out the best commentaries. That's a pretty cool book too, because that's the one that you showed me to study for our class, and it was fun to thumb through and open my eyes to the different styles of commentaries. Yeah. And then also he has a website, correct? Yeah, it's just Preaching Coach. Uh, preach. I think it's dot com, but we'll link it in the, in the notes here. Um, he's just a great resource. Well, thank you for joining us for today's convo.